Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm Pastor John Blevins, and welcome to Covenant Presbyterian Church's Sunday evening teaching series as I am working my way through Luke. Here in the building, all by myself, unfortunately, lamenting the emptiness, but looking forward to the day that we'll be gathering together again. As you know, we're interacting with the COVID-19 worldwide pandemic, the guidelines that have come our way, the recommendations from the civil magistrate, as, as well as uh, the concerns of your elders as we uh, look after and look to uh, your own health in these days, of uh, the uh, spreading of this disease, our care and love for you. And with all of those considerations together, uh, we are currently, as you know, in the morning, holding um, re a pared down as far as gathering morning worship service. It's live stream. We're, we're meeting under the number that has been recommended. We have a representation of the church through the elders. Uh, we also have uh, a deacon that's there, as you know, with providing our deacon prayer. So we're meeting in the mornings, again, lamenting the emptiness of the church, but to uh, that live stream going out, uh, we know that even in these, these times that the Lord is using uh, his, his means of grace, the preaching of His Word to build up the saints and to call the lost. And again, we lament these days, but we're looking forward to as soon as possible gathering back together. And so be looking uh, and listening out for announcements from your elders as we seek to on a weekly basis, evaluate uh, the situation and the circumstances, hopefully, as I've said, uh, to move back into as close as possible a, a normal rhythm. But to keep us there as close as we can, we're providing these pre-recorded Sunday evening teaching opportunities. So I'm thankful that you've tuned in to watch. So we're going to pray, read God's Word, teach a little bit about it, and then I hope to hear from you. Follow up and let me know your thoughts, questions, uh, and I'd love to uh, interact with you afterwards. It is a blessing to be uh, your pastor, one of your pastors. I'm thankful for that, and I pray that the Lord is looking after each of you uh, in these days. All right, well, let's, let's begin our time together as we seek the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Almighty, Triune God, Father, Son, Spirit, as we lift our faces to you in praise and worship and crying out to your name lord this even in these strange days we are thankful for this opportunity to utilize the technology that you've given to us that we might uh, continue to to hear your word read and, and to hear your word taught uh, we lord look forward to the day that you will restore our opportunity and we we pray and ask that it would be very soon that we might be able to gather back together that you would eradicate this COVID-19 sickness from our land and from your world. Lord, we pray that you would do these things to the glory of your name, that uh, even as we're watching this, whether it be on our, our TVs or our phones, tablets, our computers, whatever it may be, Lord, let this, this brief time of teaching not only glorify you, but may it benefit your people. In Christ's name we pray, amen. We're going to turn in our Bibles to Isaiah chapter 44. I'm going to read verses 1 through 8 as we read of the great truth that the Lord, our God, is our Redeemer. He is our Savior. He is our King. So we're going to read again Isaiah 44 verses 1 through 8. But now hear, O Jacob, my servant, Israel, whom I have chosen. Thus says the Lord who made you, who formed you from the womb and will keep you. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, Jerusalem, whom I have chosen. For I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry drown. I will pour my spirit upon your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. They shall spring up among the grass like willows by flowing streams. This one will say, I am the Lord's. Another will call on the name of Jacob, and another will write on his hand, the Lord's, 
and name himself by the name of Israel. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Beside me there is no God. Who is like me? Let him proclaim it. Let him declare it and set it before me. Since I appointed an ancient people, let them declare what is to come and what will happen. Fear not, nor be afraid. Have I not told you from of old and declared it? And you are my witnesses. Is there a God beside me? There is no rock. I know not any. Grass withers, flower fades, but the word of our Lord stands forever. Well, we've heard from God and his word, so let us now take advantage of the great privilege that we have as God's adopted children to cry out to him in prayer together. So while you're watching this, pray along with me. Lift up your prayers to our great God as we bow our heads and we seek to fellowship with him and to worship him in our prayer. Oh Lord, the majestic and eternal God, even now as we hear the thunder rolling outside this building, Lord, we are reminded that you are the mighty one. Even as we read in Isaiah, there is no other God. All are, are false idols, vain imaginations of men. There is no rock but you and you alone. And you, you are the king of your people. You are our redeemer. You are the Lord of hosts. You're the first and the last, the great I am. And we are thankful that we might cry out to you in prayer together. For you have promised, you have proclaimed that you are a covenant-keeping God. So as your people, we come to you. And we know that you will hear us. Because we come not in our own strength or righteousness, but we come praying in the power of the Spirit. And we come praying by the perfect righteousness of of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We are thankful that, that we do not have to live in fear, for we know that you are in control of all things. Even in these strange days where it seems that all, all things are almost grinding to a halt, it seems that there is there's so much fear and, and anxiousness and concern over even the gathering of people together. We know that even that it's not out of your control, and it does not halt the growing of your kingdom. Lord, we know that this is a time, actually, that we might grow our faith in you, for it is obvious that the attempts of, of men and women and boys and girls are of naught right now. Lord, let us not be fearful for the future of your kingdom. Let us not be fearful for the future of our king, but instead may we rest in your sovereign goodness and grace, the truth and the fact that, that the gates of hell cannot assault your church. Lord, let us not fear sickness, civil magistrate, laziness and apathy of your people, but instead may we boldly continue to go about the sharing of the hope that we have in Christ, confident that you are working and Lord, as we look forward to the ending of these uh, restrictions on gatherings, even as we see the reopening of our nation, let us not be those who are fearful, concerned that the church will never return. For Lord, that is foolishness. But instead, let us even now be praying, God, move in a mighty way that, that as we all begin to gather again, that you flood your church that we might we might be ready and prepared by the power of the spirit and we might see great renewal and reformation we might see the planting of biblical godly churches and that we will not be stepping into a a time of fearfulness 
and destruction, but instead we will continue to watch your perfect will unfold. And we beg, Lord, that it might be that even in this time of of difficulty and challenging, that we would see your church protected, growing, reaching out with the love of Christ and his gospel to all that are around us. Lord, we, we know that your perfect will is done, and we're thankful for that. And we ask that you would give our civil servants wisdom. Lord, we ask that you would restrain their hand if there might be any who seek to use moments of uncertainty to attack the church or to attack the freedoms and liberty that we have in our own nation. But instead, Lord, may you give them wisdom and fear of you that we might see through the power of your grace, the healing of the wounds, the anger, the tumult, the fighting, the bitterness that has been so rampant in our land on all sides. Lord, shower us with your grace that we might see revival and reformation. We're confident, Lord, that you will provide our daily bread, what we need, even as we know of those who've had income restricted and lessened jobs lost as we hear of the the impact economically. Lord, even as we talk to others and and hear and learn of, of some that are suffering greatly as as their economic means have been dried up, have disappeared. Lord, we pray that you would would cause your people to respond, that the deacons of your church might be made aware of the great needs and that your people would give generously to care for those needs, to provide for them, that you would use us. For we know that that you own the cattle on a thousand hills, and it is all yours the treasure you give to us to steward for a short time. Lord, it's yours. Let us not grip it so tightly that we might not be able to put it to use for your kingdom. Lord, we pray that you would look after those who are sick. Even within the body here at Covenant, we have those who are recovering from surgeries, recovering from sicknesses that have been diagnosed even this week. Lord, we pray for your healing, and we ask that in the midst of this time that that our brothers and sisters would grow in their faith and love for you. Lord, we pray for the concerns over COVID-19, even as, even as we hear of, of, Lord, those in our own presbytery who have been impacted. We, we ask that you would, would grant strength and, and grace and comfort in their mourning as they've lost loved ones. Lord, we pray that you would, would be with us as a people that we wouldn't live fearful, but that you would also keep this sickness at bay, that you'd put a hedge of protection around us, that you would bring an end to this pandemic, that, Lord, we'd have wisdom to know how to live in a way that does love our neighbors, but also does not seek to, to bring everything to a halt for an indefinite period of time. Lord, we pray for spiritual bread, that you would care for us, you would grow us in your grace, that you would make us more like our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, that that we would not waste the days that we have, that, Lord, we would not be slothful, but that we would see the great opportunities before us. Lord, there is so much that we can entertain ourselves with. Let that not be the point or desire of our existence. But, Lord, let us be purposeful as we seek to to grow in your truth, through your grace, through your word and prayer, to be more like Jesus. Make us a people that are quick to forgive. Let us keep short accounts. You've forgiven us for so much. Lord, let us be willing to, to put up with the insults and the attacks of the world that we might bring the only good news, message of hope, the only message of life, and that is the gospel. May we be willing to put up 
with the assaults of those who are in rebellion against you that we might share the hope that we have in our Savior, Jesus Christ, with them, that we might introduce them to the Savior. And then we ask, Lord, we, we beg that you would move. For we know that you are a God that loves to save sinners. And we know even as we pray now, many of us were once horribly wicked, rebellious sinners. Even those who've had the, the great privilege to grow up never knowing a day that they did not love you, they still feel the sting of sin and temptation that they battle. Lord, we are not perfect. We know that that will not come to glory. So let us not be those who wouldn't live by faith. Let us not be those who would turn our attention from the great truth that you bring to us in your word. Let us instead be those who would take your word and prayer and use them that we might go to war against the temptations in our life. Lord, we pray that you would strengthen us. Let us not be worn down, beat down as the, the rocks on the seashore are by the waves, but instead, Lord, may, may in Christ we be a massive seawall that the temptations come and break upon because of Christ. Oh, Lord, we pray that you would would do these things, that you would not forget us, and we know that you won't. You are a, a faithful, you are the faithful covenant-keeping God. And Lord, as we, we come to our time in your word and open it, we ask that you teach us. You would not let our, our few minutes together be one that we simply listen to and move on but that by faith we would hear, or by faith we would see. And the Spirit would use even, even this Sunday night teaching to save the lost, and to build up the saints, that we might look more like our Savior, in whose name we pray. Amen. Well, if you'll turn your Bibles to Luke... Luke chapter 9. We're going to be continuing our move through uh, the gospel according to Luke, looking at verses 18 through 20 uh, tonight as we're together. As we're turning in there, I'll remind you, as I do every time, we're each evening, Sunday evening, that we've spent uh, in this teaching series over these last few weeks, that, that Luke is, is written to confirm the certainty of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we see in our passage this evening that, that Jesus is asking a specific question to the disciples about who he is. We get to see the Lord bring that answer. So follow along God's perfect and errant and sufficient word. Luke chapter 9, verses 18 through 20. Now it happened that as he was praying alone, the disciples were with him, and he asked them, who do the crowds say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist, but others say Elijah, and others that, that one of the prophets of old has risen. Then he said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, the Christ of God. Have you ever heard of the term retcon or retconning? It's a term that's becoming a little bit more familiar if you, if you pay attention to some things and listen. And then after I give you kind of a, an idea of what it is, I think you might go, oh, yeah. I mean, I've known that term, but I've, I've seen that going on. Uh, retcon is a shortening of a, a longer word. Retroactive continuity. And basically, in a nutshell, it comes from the literary world, particularly in the fiction uh, realm. Uh, and what it is, retconning, what that means is there's been a, a storyline that's been going on in a, a piece of literature, fictional literature, and it's been going along, and there's certain facts, and there's things that are established in this little universe 
And retconning is when the author or new authors or whoever is involved, they come in and they go, well, you know, we're just going to ignore this. We're going to change this. We're going to create a new reality and act as if this is it. This is what it's always been and just move forward. It's primarily in the in fictional literature where we come from, but, but it's seeped into almost every avenue of our culture. Uh, and I think it's it seeped into every avenue of our culture, and people uh, are beginning to uh, identify things by that term, uh, not because retconning is something that's totally new and never happened before. In fact, I think all, throughout all human history, you constantly have people that are trying to, to manipulate, change the past, the facts of the past. It just became so clear when folks began to take this and, and look for it everywhere. And I think that if you would, would humbly look around you, and, and I mean look in every corner, you'll pick up that some folks are doing it probably not meaningfully. They don't realize it. Others, uh, sadly, are, are probably being a little bit more aggressive in what they're doing and attempting to actually change a narrative by ignoring or pretending old facts are or never existed in trying to establish totally new ones to fit their own narrative. Uh, and when you hear this definition of retcon, you know, what, is, what do you think of? What do you think is, what person is the biggest target throughout history for over 2,000 years? The biggest hit, hit biggest target of retconning. Who do you think that is? Yeah, I agree with you. I think it's the Lord Jesus Christ. There has been folks, I mean, look at church history and those inside the wolves inside the church and wolves outside the church. There has been an attempt almost every generation to try to take hold of, of who Jesus is, take and disconnect him from the reality of what the Bible tells us, what truth is, history is, and then turn Jesus into their own, make him part of their own story, weapon, whatever, to, to utilize their own beliefs. Sadly, there's, there's several ways this has happened. Uh, you know, facts get ignored, and these attempts are made, and there's a few major ways I think today it's happening. And here, here are a couple of them of how folks have totally flipped the reality of who Jesus is on its head. One, Jesus, some people claim Jesus is the, is the retelling of ancient pagan myths. He never existed, but instead it was kind of a lazy action of a group of people who've looked to these ancient myths all over the ancient Near East, brought them together, and we've created this kind of savior type. But he never existed. Come on. That would be an, a retcon. A, another we see is that, that some claim that Jesus is a false Jewish prophet that should just be ignored. He doesn't, he doesn't pass any of the tests. And again, they're trying to retcon the reality of who the Lord Jesus Christ is. Another is that you may hear someone say, Jesus is he's a, a great teacher, but it's those horrible later Christians who came along and, and seeking to grab power over other men. They elevated this wonderful rabbi who sought just love and peace. They elevated him to a position he never would have wanted to say that he is the God-man. He is the Redeemer. He is the Messiah, the Christ. So it's really the church and their retcon. They claim there was a retcon. But again, that's not what the scriptures tell us. And another is Jesus is a social revolutionary looking to destroy the social order and upturn it. But again, this is just another case of retconning. Or Jesus is about your best life now. It's kind of a combination of a maybe part genie, part self-help guru. And it's really... What do, you, what do you need to be a better person? Well, that's who Jesus is. That's a, a retcon. 
And then there's, I think, the ultimate retcon that's happening right now in our current times. Uh, and that is what I think is most, most prevalent today is the you do you attitude, the you do you philosophy. Hey, you know what? Jesus, Jesus can be anything you want Jesus to be or not be. You don't want the reality that Jesus exists? Okay, because you get to create your own reality. I get to create my own reality. He gets to create his own reality. She gets to create her own reality. Everyone gets to create their own reality because it's all about you do you. And I think that's one of the biggest retcons that's happening right now. Just saying, look, hey, you just, you just rewrite anything you want, particularly Jesus, who he is. You rewrite that by what you desire. But that's not what the scriptures tell us. And that's not reality. All of this is clearly all these attempts and retconning are, are to sweep away the truth of what our passage shows us in the Scriptures. And our passage points out clearly that Jesus is the Christ who came to save His people. Jesus is the Christ who came to save His people. In our teaching tonight, we're just going to look at this passage. We're going to unpack it using Jesus' two questions. First, uh, Jesus' first question, Who do the crowds say that I am? And Jesus' second question, who do you say that I am? So Jesus' first question that he asked to the disciples, who do the crowd say that I am? There's a context to this question uh, that Jesus brings here. First thing, right off the bat, in the, in the context of this question, you know, Jesus has brought the, the twelve, the disciples, they're alone, but what is it we see right off the bat? Now it happened that as he was praying alone, the disciples were with him. So before we move on, let's not miss this. Again, we see Jesus in prayer. And this is a good time to ask that question. Why does Jesus pray so much? Have you thought about that? I bet you have. Kids, children, youth, have you thought about that question? Why does Jesus pray so much? If he is the God man, why would he need to pray? Well, I think there's several things that are, that are going on here. Uh, Jesus, Jesus prayed often. In the Gospels, we see him often praying, it's recorded. He's often praying to God the Father because the Holy Spirit filled him with a spirit of prayer. You remember as we go back in, in Luke, as we've been moving our way through, we understand that, uh, that the Lord Jesus Christ, the God-man, is filled, overflowing, and anointed by the Holy Spirit. And it would only make sense. The Holy Spirit is the one who teaches us how to pray. The Holy Spirit is the one who gives us strength and power in our prayers. Would not the Holy Spirit anointing the Christ cause him to want to pray? To drive his prayers? I see also that, that Jesus prayed to God the Father for fellowship and communion. See all the things that are happening here as, as Jesus, the God man, as he comes in prayer, he's coming in the power of the Spirit, he's coming in his own righteousness, and he's coming in prayer to God the Father, as we see in the scriptures. And, and what we, we see in these times of prayer is, is times of communion and fellowship in the Godhead. Now, you know. There's a lot more going on than in, God, in Jesus' prayers that's simply being an example to us. But at the same time, don't, let us not miss that. For we are called to be conformed to the image of our Savior. We're, we're called to, and by God's grace, to, to grow up in Christ and to be more like Him. So we wouldn't want to miss the fact that He spent a ton of time in prayer. And hopefully it encourages us, children, hopefully it encourage you that, yes, it's, it's important that we, we bring our needs and in prayer or petitions for others and, and we beseech the Lord for those things. That's important. We don't want to ignore that. But at the same time, the greatest part of prayer, you know, as we come to the Lord, I mean, prayer is called the chief exercise of our faith. It, it is our fellowship and communion with God. That's how we talk to God. He talks to us in His Word. We read the Bible. God is talking. And then we talk back and prayer. It's one of the reasons why it's so important for, for your prayers to be 
overflowing with God's word, that you pray God's word back to him, just another depth to our relationship with the Lord. So Jesus hears the answer from the disciples about who the people say he is. These people have seen Jesus' power and authority uh, in miracles. Just We just came out of the, the feeding of the 5,000. So Jesus taught, as he has been teaching, with, with great power and authority. He performs this miracle where he takes a, a, you know, just a couple pieces of fish and some bread, and he feeds 5,000. Out of nothing creates this, which opens up a window to many things. But they see that power. They've seen him resurrect dead folks, heal cast out demons, his power and authority has been on display, period. And yet there's still, there's still this question, who is this Jesus? You know, again, it reminds us that, that we can't manipulate, convince, argue, debate anyone to heaven. It's not a decision that we make, but it is by God's grace as he pours it out upon us and the Holy Spirit gives us new hearts gives us life, spiritual, eternal life. It is God who saves. Even with all of this irrefutable evidence in front of these people, there's, there's still the question, as Jesus asked, you know, who are they saying that, people saying that I am? And we hear their answers. John the Baptist, Elijah, maybe a, a prophet of old. You know, this section here about who is Jesus, it starts off with, with uh, the question from Herod, trying to figure out who Jesus is. And then it comes to, to Jesus asking these questions of the disciples to clarify who he is. See, the crowd misses the fact that, that this is the Christ, the Messiah before them. And instead, their answer is having all of this irrefutable evidence, as I just said, in front of them, their answer is not, oh, it's the Messiah, it's the Christ. Their answer is all of those who point to the Messiah, all of those who prepare the way for Christ. That's the answer that they give. You know, they talk of the prophets of old. Well, in, in Luke... 24, 44, as Jesus is walking with the, the disciples, then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. All these things were written about the Lord Jesus Christ. So we, Jesus isn't one of these prophets of old, particularly a great prophet that is remembered by God's people, uh, Elijah. They, they think this must be Elijah, for they remember in Malachi. Uh, they read in Malachi chapter 4, we read as well, verse 5, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. So they see all these things, and the response isn't, oh, this is the Messiah, but it is, oh, this must be the one preparing the way for the Messiah, which, which drives straight from there. Well, if this is Elijah who's come back, Jesus himself has already said that's not the fact. He's not Elijah. In Matthew 17, 12, But I tell you that Elijah has already come, and they did not recognize him, but did to him whatever they pleased, so also the Son of Man will certainly suffer at their hands. Even in Luke, it's clear. In Luke chapter 3, Jesus is not, Jesus is not the one like Elijah come to prepare the way. That's not who uh, Jesus is in Luke chapter 3. It goes right in the beginning. It talks about in the time of the priesthood of Ananias and, and Caiaphas, and he's going through this and that. The word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He goes through, and we hear the prophets, prophecy from Isaiah, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled. Every mountain and hill shall be made low. And it, it, preparing the way, preparing the way, preparing the way. 
So as the crowds say, well, he, he is John the Baptist. He's come back somehow. He, he is Elijah, which is who John the Baptist is, the new Elijah, the one like Elijah. He is a prophet of old, risen. See, they, they keep pointing to, to, the, to those who point to Jesus, and they miss the fact that, no, he, no Jesus is Christ. He's the Christ. He's the Messiah. It was right there in front of them. I saw it. So let that remind you. One, may it humble us. Because even as we read God's word, your mind didn't click on its own and go, ooh, oh, I've unlocked it. I understand the gospel. Yes, God, I will come to you and cast my vote for you. Yes, I believe in you. But no, it's, it's God who saves so may it humble us, and may it cause us to be faithful. Just be faithful, as God has commanded us in all ways, especially in the sharing of the hope that we have in Christ and sharing the gospel. Be faithful in these things, following God's commands from His Word, sharing the gospel that God might save others. So this first question, Jesus Christ asks, who do the crowd say that I am? Jesus' second question He asks, to the disciples, who do you say that I am? You know, Jesus, having heard the, the crowd's answer, he focuses now on what the disciples believe about him. It moves beyond what all, what, what, what all they're saying, and now it's, what, what do you, what do you say? You know, I've talked to some people before, and offhandedly they'll when you talk to them about salvation, Christianity, you talk to them about the Lord, faith, and, and as crazy as this sounds, and maybe you've had these same conversations, I've actually had people refer to, well, you know, my grandfather was a such-and-such such minister, pastor. Um, you know, my cousin is a, a missionary. Uh, you know, my parents had a, a deep faith. And <laughs> I've even been caught in these conversations in my mind thinking, well, well, that's great, but what's that do with you? See, because and children, you particularly keep this in mind, God doesn't have any grandchildren. He saves and adopts His children. There's a lot of wonderful, wonderful blessings that come from being a covenant child. But your salvation is not based on anybody else other than Christ. It's based on Christ, period, not yourself. But no one else, maybe you've heard the saying, you can, you can lead a horse to the water, but you can't make the horse drink. Well, it is the Holy Spirit that causes horses to drink. The Holy Spirit who gives new life. But it is, it is you that has to own these things. Not just sitting back and, oh, you know, mom, dad, pretty good Christians. I'll probably skate in somehow at the end underneath there, tagging along, holding onto their hand be all right. You know, we don't believe that anybody builds up any type of merit or grace that they can dispense out and dole to others. That is a false view that is not taught in the Bible. These crowds, they've answered their question. Jesus asked the question to the disciples, who do you say that I am? Even as Jesus is asking that question to you, who do you say that I am? What do you believe about me? So Peter, speaking for the twelve, proclaims that Jesus is the Christ of God. His proclamation comes in the middle of this section, this kind of who is Jesus section uh, that we see here in chapter 9. And it started out back with Herod in, uh, in verse 9 here in chapter 9. Turn back there and remind you of that. Herod said, John I beheaded, but who is this about whom I hear such things? And he sought to see him. There's this question, who is this Jesus? And then the end of this section comes because God the Father speaks about who Jesus is. As we look here in chapter 9, you look to verse 35. This is part of the transfiguration. We'll be there very soon, but just the specific right here. Verse 35, And a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my Son 
my chosen one, listen to him. This is my son, the Messiah, the Christ, the chosen one, the anointed one. Listen to him. We have this little section, and right in the middle, we have Peter standing up speaking for the rest of the twelve, for the disciples, and Peter makes this proclamation. Jesus, you're the Christ of God. He answers this question correctly. And God confirms later in verse 35 what Peter has said is truth. It is true. Jesus is the Christ. So, Jesus, that's Jesus' name. And, and Jesus' name means uh, Jehovah's salvation. Uh, we learn what the name means and as we turn to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, as the angel is speaking to Joseph as Mary is carrying the Lord Jesus Christ, the God-man, in her womb as the incarnation has happened and his birth is coming. In verse 21, as the angel's talking to Joseph, he says, "...she will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus." for he will save his people from their sins. You know, Jesus, Jehovah's salvation, says, he's being told right here, you will, name, you will name the child Jesus because he's going to save his people from their sins. It's the purpose of why he's coming. That's what it's all about, being the Christ, the Messiah. So that's Jesus' name. But, but Christ isn't a name. Christ is a title. Jesus is his name. Christ is his title. Greek, Christ is Greek. It's the equivalent to the Hebrew uh, Messiah. It means the anointed one, the Lord's anointed one. Even as we saw there in verse 35, as, as God the Father said, listen, this is my son, the chosen one. His confirmation. This is my Christ. Listen to him. So the title, Jesus Christ, Jesus, the one who will save his people from their sins because he is the Lord's anointed one, the chosen one. Peter's proclamation as he makes this, as he answers the question, you are the Christ of God. And what he's basically saying Jesus, you are the Redeemer God's people are waiting on. Jesus, you're, you're the Redeemer that, that we, the disciples, have been waiting on. Jesus, you're the Redeemer, the one that I, Peter, have been waiting on. That's what he's saying when he makes that proclamation. This is who you are, and I believe it. So what does it mean to believe that Jesus is the Christ? You know, it's one thing to say, I believe in Jesus. But right after someone says that, right after you say that, there has to be a follow-up with, but, but who do you believe Jesus is? Who is this Jesus you believe in? You know, we turn to Matthew chapter 7. I'm just going to let Jesus stand here, and let's, let's hear what he has to say. When, when we have this question of, Yes, someone, maybe even you say, I believe in Jesus. Well, the question is, well, what Jesus? Who is this Jesus you believe in? Matthew 7, starting in verse 15, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear good, bad fruit, but can a diseased tree bear good fruit? Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and, and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. 
Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. If you believe in a Jesus other than the Lord Jesus Christ as he reveals himself in the Bible, then you're building on sand. And when the storm comes, great will be the fall of your house. You're building upon a false pseudo foundation. You're the one who, who comes and, and Jesus says, truly, truly, I, I do not know you. It matters who, the, who Jesus is. It's one thing to say, I believe in Jesus. But which Jesus? You know, Muslims, Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, liberals, Oneness Pentecostals, those are just a few that all believe in Jesus but deny what the Bible teaches about Jesus. They do not believe that Jesus is the God-man. They do not believe in the Trinity, as has been revealed in the Scriptures. One God and three persons, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. But instead, they believe in, in a false Jesus, a, a Jesus who is a prophet, a Jesus who is a Savior, a, a Jesus who is a great teacher, but not Jesus as he's revealed in Scripture. Not, not what we fully understand as the God-man. Not the Christ of God. Anyone who's confronted with the Bible and what it says about Jesus, what Jesus says in the Bible, what, what the Bible says, period, that's God's word. Anyone confronted with that and says, oh, no, that's, that's, oh, that's not the Jesus that I believe in. Weep inside for that person. If, that, man, if that's you, you believe in an idol. If someone says that, they believe in an idol. That's not, that's not who Jesus is, is revealed in the Scripture. As he asks this question, who do you say that I am? And Peter answers, the Christ of God. believe in anything other than what the scriptures reveal. It's folly and it's eternal death. Jesus is the God-man. He is God the Son, the second person of the Trinity, come in flesh, living a perfect life, keeping God's law, going to the cross, dying and atoning, sacrificial death, paying the penalty for the sins of his people, rising on the third day in his resurrection, taking those whom God has given to him, who the Father gave to him, giving them salvation as his righteousness is placed on them. In his resurrection, we are raised. In his perfect righteousness, we have salvation. It's about Jesus. It's about Jesus. He is the Redeemer, the Christ, the Messiah. And the scriptures are full of this truth full of it on your own time. Here's your homework. I want you to turn to Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 and read it. I want you to prayerfully read through 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 8. I want you to prayerfully read through 1 Peter 2, 21 through 25. And finally, your last homework assignment for today is to read Titus 3, 3 through 7. And these are just a few places in the scripture to get you started. Prayerfully read them. Worship God as you read them. Be in awe of our great God. Jesus is the Christ who came to save his people. You know, Jesus' first question, who did the crowd say that I am? Followed up by his second question. Jesus asked, who do you say that I am? 
Our passage tells us the answer is Jesus is the Christ who came to save His people. Now be on guard. Be on guard for retconning. I mean, it's bad enough in our culture and our society, the damage it does across the board. Now, sometimes it's kind of silly. Like, it's just damages a great story. You're like, man, that was a great book. They ruined the movie. Well, those were good movies, and they ruined it. Man, that book series was really good, and they, they destroyed it. Man, what a great story that was. It got wrecked. You know, that's a bummer. That has an impact, but that's kind of on a silly level. But then as you move to the very, very important things, And that would be, man, I can't believe they're trying to take the truth of Scripture and ignore it and replace it with man's foolish, wicked thoughts and pass that off as who Jesus is. Pass that off as what the gospel is. Pass that off as the purpose of the church. Pass that off as as who God is. Be on guard against that. Read the Scriptures. Go to the source. Read the Scriptures by faith in God's grace so that you might understand and not fall for this crazy, wicked, out-of-control retconning that happens so that you, instead of being swept away with the rebels, might be one who would, who would stand instead and say, no, that is not truth. And you'd be faithful as you proclaim the Gospel and God's Word to others all the while praying, God, please use my feeble words. May the Spirit work. Save this person. Let them have eyes to see and ears to hear the gospel. Trust in Jesus Christ. Love Him and be faithful to Him in His Word every day. And do it by faith and by His grace and for His glory so that you might enjoy Him today and every day from now through all eternity. Oh, Lord, may it be. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we are so thankful that You, that You have proclaimed in Your Word the truth that Lord Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the God-man, that He is God the Son. And that it is clear from Your Word that the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. May we not deny what is so clear. May You work in our hearts and our minds that we would not only stand for this truth against all odds, against all attacks, against all doubts and fears, but that you would also work to strengthen that assurance in us and give us a great love for you. May we enjoy you every day as we seek to glorify you. Lord, we're thankful to be your people. Greatest blessing ever. There is nothing greater. Let us delight in you. Let us be thankful for you. And let us be quick to share the hope we have, willing to put up with with all types of difficulties that we might be used by you to share the gospel as you continue to grow your kingdom. Oh Lord, thank you, thank you, thank you. We love you in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Look forward to seeing you soon. Again, love to hear from you. Let me know. Uh, let me know how the Lord is working in your heart on these days. Uh, reach out to one another. Give each other calls. Text each other. Take advantage of all the opportunities we're providing. Yes, lament the days that we've been, we're being separated, but look forward to the days that are coming as we're going to be back together again. But most important in the midst of all this, keep your eyes on Christ, for He is our hope. He is our hope.